I think, hoax. Look, I think the collusion thing is, and I've said it from day one, is, is a joke. We couldn't, I was there. We couldn't collude. We had a tough time colluding between the Trump campaign in Pennsylvania and the RNC, right? I mean, all of our stuff is a ground game. So I, I think it's a, it, look, have some marginal guys and there were definitely some marginal people early on in the campaign. There was an island of misfit toys, right? Good morning and welcome to AM Joy. Donald Trump is in Manila today for a summit hosted by Philippine leader Rodrigo Duterte, a strong man known for his populist message and disregard for the rule of law, who Trump seems to rather admire. We'll have more on that later. But first, here at home, new developments in the Russia probe have undermined a key defense put out by Trump allies that the people ensnared by the Mueller investigation are marginal figures in Trump world, nothing but coffee boys. Well, we now know that George Papadopoulos, whom Trump has called a low-level volunteer, made a foreign trip as a representative of the campaign. According to the BBC, he also edited a policy speech Trump gave in April of 2016, according to the New York Times. Papadopoulos was also in regular contact with campaign aide Stephen Miller when he was told that the Russians had dirt on Hillary Clinton in the form of thousands of emails. Papadopoulos has, of course, pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI and faces prison time. Another supposedly marginal figure, Carter Page, repeatedly told campaign staffers about his meetings with, rank, with high-ranking Russian officials. As the investigations creep closer to Trump's inner circle, Miller, now a White House senior policy advisor, has reportedly spoken to the special counsel's office. And Trump's longtime former bodyguard, Keith Schiller, told Congress that when Trump was in Russia for the 2013 Miss Universe pageant, a Russian businessman offered to send five women to Trump's hotel room. Schiller said he refused on Trump's behalf. And on Tuesday, Attorney General Jeff Sessions will be grilled in Congress about why his statements on the Trump campaign's Russia contacts don't match up with testimony by Papadopoulos and Page. The Russia investigation is getting closer to Donald Trump, and not for nothing, but it seems highly unlikely that his campaign was comprised entirely of coffee boys. And joining me now is Nayara Haq, former State Department senior advisor, Aswin Subasang, politics reporter at The Daily Beast, and Natasha Bertrand, political correspondent at Business Insider, along with Masha Gessen, author of The Future is History, How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia. Thank you all for being here. And Aswin, I'm going to go to you on this first because the... The Trump campaign, the Trump team, the White House team's defense has been that each of these people in turn, including Paul Manafort, who was campaign chairman, were simply marginal to the campaign. Right. Is this a defense that they're coordinating from inside the White House? What, where, do you have any reporting on where they came up with this idea? Because it seems on its face to be ridiculous. Well, this is certainly something that President Donald Trump himself has been trying to scream from the rooftops. And when it comes to someone like Paul Manafort, trying to call him a marginal figure is, of course, patently on its face absolutely ridiculous. He mm -hmm. had had the campaign for quite some time, and even before that, he was a key player in the campaign when Corey Lewandowski headed it. With someone like George Papadopoulos, their case is a little bit easier because technically they were correct. He was a minor figure, someone a lot of people in the campaign was a joke. Having said that, the degree to which the Trump campaign was run in a Bush League fashion uh, made it possible for people like George Papadopoulos in their minor roles to sort of worm their way into... Um, coordinating with people in the top brass of the campaign. But, you know, Nayara, when, you know, people who've worked on campaigns, I've worked on a, a couple of campaigns, you know, the Foreign Policy Advisory Committee doesn't necessarily sit down with the candidate. You know, this is a committee that is putting together the policy papers, their work ends up in the speeches. It, they don't have to be in day-to-day -day contact with the candidate themselves to be important figures. And in the case of Papadopoulos, there's, uh, New York Times has some of the emails that he sent to Stephen Miller, who I don't think they would argue is a marginal figure. He's now writing Trump's speeches. He's a White House advisor. The day before he learned about the hacked emails in New York Times, right, Mr. Papadopoulos emailed Mr. Miller, then a senior policy advisor to the campaign, saying Mr. Trump had an open invitation from Mr. Putin to visit Russia. The day after, he wrote Mr. Miller that if he had some, he had some interesting messages coming in from Moscow about a trip when the time is right. You've in the State Department, it would it be normal for a marginal figure, aka a coffee boy, to be able to provide that kind of potential, uh, at least offers of access? Absolutely not. But exactly as you mentioned about the Bush League fashion, you could have very junior staff have very high level access. And we saw that translate into the White House as well, where prior to General Kelly arriving as Chief of Staff, pretty much anybody in the White House was able to walk in and get an Oval Office meeting and make themselves heard with Donald Trump. Yep. This is clearly something that Putin 
Putin and his KGB-like friends are aware of. And this is why they targeted these specific people in order to be able to get access to the White House. And now we're going to see how far this goes. I think the broader question in the context of this Asia trip in which Donald Trump sat down with Putin and had the one-on-one -on -one meetings and walked away saying, oh, well, I asked the guy and he said, no, we did not interfere in your election. And I absolutely believe him. We're starting to understand because of the Mueller investigation why it is that Donald Trump is not, never going to insult Putin. It's probably the only person he will never insult in this world. And why it is that he's so ready to believe anything that Putin and Russia say, it, that, that's at the core of the American public wanting to understand what the collusion is. Because this is a unprecedented friendliness and uh, being uh, cozy with not just Russia, but an actual adversary. Well, you, you've called it up, so let me go ahead and play what you're talking about, what Naira is talking about, is Donald Trump's, uh, while he's on this trip in Asia, he's taught, he was asked about Russian interference in the election, uh, and here he is trying to square the discrepancy between whether or not the American intelligence agencies who work for Donald Trump uh, are right or whether Putin is right when he denies that he interfered in our election. Here's Donald Trump. As to whether I believe it or not, I'm with our agencies, especially as currently constituted with their leadership. I believe in our intel agencies, our intelligence agencies. I've worked with them very strongly. Uh, there weren't 17, as was previously reported. There were actually four, uh, but they were saying there were 17. There were actually four. But as currently uh, led by fine people, I believe very much in our intelligence agencies. The little number discrepancy he's trying to do there is that there's the CIA, there's the, F, there's the CIA, uh, there's the NSA, there's the Directorate of National Intelligence, and under the Directorate of National Intelligence, there are other agencies. So he's trying to sort of reduce the number of agencies in the federal government that all agree that Vladimir Putin's uh, Kremlin was involved in interfering our election. But here is what Donald Trump said about Putin himself, and when he talked to Putin, what he believes about what Putin said. I'm surprised that there's any uh, conflict on this. What I said there is that I believe he believes that, and that's very important for somebody to believe. I believe that he feels that he and Russia did not meddle in the election. Masha, I feel like the thing that is that, that all of these uh, people have in common, whether it is Carter Page, whether it is George Papadopoulos, or whether, it, frankly, it's Donald Trump, is this real sort of almost, you know, childlike faith in Vladimir Putin. Uh, essentially, all of these people believe they can sit down with Putin, get him to get into a room with Donald Trump, that the things he says are, are, are authentic, and that he's somebody that they all clearly were very eager to work with. Um, that obviously, is that what Putin's sort of... Uh, upper hand here was, was that he had so many people who were eager, eager to be friendly with him. You know, I think you're right to say the word eager. I don't think that there's that this has anything to do with authenticity, right? I don't think that anybody, including Donald Trump, is actually thinking that Putin is telling the truth, right? Because we're not talking about collusion here. He actually asked uh, Putin, uh, or he supposedly asked Putin about meddling in the election. Meddling in the election is not in question, right? The intelligence agencies agree that he meddled in the election. Russian investigative reporters have, have shown that, that, that Russia meddled in the election. I mean, this has been shown beyond any shadow of a doubt, unlike collusion, which can, you know, we still don't know uh, whether that can be proved or not. So um, when Trump says that Putin uh, didn't meddle and that he believes Putin, he's really talking about power, right? He thinks that Putin has the power to claim that he didn't meddle in the election, even though it is obviously not true. Just as Trump lies to, to show power, so he sees Putin lying to show power, and he sort of acknowledges that power, and he gives him more power than he is giving to American intelligence agencies. Yeah, clear. And, and it's also, Natasha, clearly also, you know, if there is a quid pro quo that one can sort of surmise from what we know so far in the Russian investigation, it does feel like on the Russian side of that alleged potential transaction, sanctions were at the core of it. This is Donald Trump then talking about sanctions. It feels like all of these meetings somehow got back to this idea of undoing the sanctions against Russia, especially the Magnitsky sanctions. And this is Donald Trump, President of the United States, talking about those sanctions. Here he is. And, you know, people don't realize Russia has been very, very heavily sanctioned. They were sanctioned at a very high level. And that took place very recently. It's now time to get back to healing a world that is shattered and broken. 
And Natasha, in your reporting, were these, whether they want to talk, call them low-level people or not, they feel, it feels like they were, that the offer that maybe they were attempting to put on the table was openness on changing or even getting rid of these sanctions. Right, and what's interesting is that um, Trump's first meeting with Vladimir Putin, well, actually his second meeting that he had at the G20 during that dinner, he said later on that, that Putin actually mentioned the Magnitsky Act sanctions. He said they talked about adoptions, and it was very interesting. Um, and then we find out that, you know, they had this meeting at Trump Tower where they talked about adoptions, which is another code word for the Magnitsky Act sanctions. So it's, it seems clear that at the core of Russia's outreach to the Trump campaign, they were offering some kind of dirt on Hillary Clinton in exchange for a promise or some kind of commitment that the administration, the White House, would then look into removing these sanctions because that is a number one foreign policy goal of Vladimir Putin's. He hates the Magnitsky Act sanctions. He, he's been trying to undo them since 2012. And of course, he did ban Americans from adopting American from adopting Russian children in retaliation for those sanctions. So that is a huge priority for him, and it makes total sense why this would be at the top of his list in reaching out to the Trump campaign and seeing what their reaction would be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Ashley, you have Carter Page, who's on record being very much against the sanctions. You have George Papadopoulos, who, you know, he's calling himself low level, but he's there trying to broker a meeting with Vladimir Putin. What else would it be about? We're now learning uh, from the reporting that uh, allegedly the reason that he was willing to lie to the FBI and risk going to prison was out of loyalty to Donald Trump. You have this, you know, it, it does feel like that is what the quid, that's what we're, we're pushing toward, right? A quid pro quo. We will look at sanctions again and we'll take whatever help you can give us on Hillary Clinton. Right, and there's certainly a lot of uh, sketchy Russia and or Putin-friendly individuals going in and out of Trump world, at least over the last uh, two years or so. But when it comes to the President of the United States himself, uh, there seems to be this ritual of people setting their hair on fire whenever he comes out and publicly says, Essentially, he believes Vladimir Putin and not the U.S. intelligence agencies. I, I got to tell you, it would honestly be news at this point if he came out and said the opposite. Yeah. That he believed American intelligence apparatus and not Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin. Because this, is his, this has been his tune for over a year now, and it's a point of pride almost for him. It's not a matter of analysis or uh, uh, intellectually discerning what is actually going on in this particular case case, it's the president not willing to back down on anything. And at this point, it just happens to deal with the Kremlin. Yeah, and, I, well, and the Kremlin and, and Turkey and other autocratic regimes. I mean, Donald Trump clearly uh, and his campaign team knew to surround him by people who agree with him that Putin should be our friend, who agree with him in sort of cuddling up to strong men like Erdogan. You have Michael Flynn and his son apparently p perhaps even maybe organizing a kidnapping uh, in order to, to help out the Turkish government now being investigated for that. So this feels like this idea that these are just low-level nobodies. No, these are people who are cultivated because they had a, a similar mindset and a similar way of viewing the world as Donald Trump. Oh, and that's part of signing up for a campaign. That's you right. Sign, you sign up for a campaign because you believe in what the candidate is, says and what they stand for. And Donald Trump is pretty basic, actually. It's, it's a very basic, straightforward assessment of who he is. He likes strong men. He wants to be around people who can project power and who are willing to disregard rule of law. It is not, he is not at the, at have the depth that we've seen in previous administrations of understanding intellectually what rule of law means, how the Constitution works. He's made several statements about uh, regret that the DOJ can't get involved in the way he would like them to in various uh, operations. And that is interesting that he is ending his Asia trip with Duterte, who is somebody who has disregarded rule of law and had his police kill thousands of his sure. own citizens without uh, any trial. This is the type of energy and power uh, and idea that Trump is going to come back to the United States with. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you to Naira Hawk and Aswin Subh saying that Tasha and Masha will be back in their name.